Uh, thanks. Um, really some wonderful talks. I might actually be bringing it down here because I'm going to go back to the sort of purified compounds, the synthetic compounds, THC and CBD, and really focus on those. But kind of what I'm hoping to get out of this talk with you is to have some sort of um, knowledge of the basic mechanisms that um, are sort of <coughs> you can be seen across both with THC and CBD that lead to anti-tumor activity. Nope. Oh, I might need a little bit of help here on the. This should be the advanced reverse in, the, in your spot. Okay. Good, great. Um, I'm out in San Francisco. This is just a sm picture of our institute, and we're located right downtown by the ballpark. Um, I don't think this group really needs a definition of cannabinoids, so I'll skip this slide and I'll go through a couple quickly, uh, quickly, so we can get to um, questions. I really just here, I'm just trying to show you the structural diversity of cannabinoids. I've always been impressed by it. Um, I'm sorry. Let's see if we can go back. And there we go. So we have our, of course, um, natural plant derived cannabinoids. We have synthetic versions. Um, this is a compound I'm going to talk about later, which we've really developed to focus on anti tumor properties. We have our endogenous agonists, um, our cannabinoid receptor antagonists, and this is one of my uh, recent favorites. We like, I just call it BCP, because it's a mouthful. But um, this is from the terpenes, and again, it's a CB2 agonist. Really impressive for a plant. All right. So um, this is basically a clinical review of many, um, basically, therapeutic agents that they're or either been in the clinic or are actually making their way through the clinic um, through what I call more standard routes, uh, more standard drug development routes. So you can uh, read through those, but I'm actually going to focus here down on the um, anti-tumor agents. And this you might not be as familiar with, but there's actually three companies right now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this clinical trial and that data, that are actually going after um, targeting uh, brain cancer in patients. So this is actually We'll have some data. These are basically, they're getting the trials uh, set up. But again, um, in these cases, they're using um, cannabinoid base. This, uh, the trial I'll show you is um, the Sativex. Uh, Insys Therapeutics is going to use CBD alone. And this company is using a synthetic version of THC that is not psychoactive called uh, dexanabinol. So why cancer? Let me talk a little bit about uh, cannabinoids and cancer. Um, so first of all, we're all very familiar with using THC and cannabis-based products to treat the symptoms associated with cancer treatment, inhibition of pain, enhanced to enhance appetite and decrease nausea. But actually, there's very strong preclinical data showing that both CBD and THC act as direct anti-tumor agents. In addition, there's preclinical evi pre evidence, and this is all in mouse models, showing that the, both CBD and THC can inhibit uh, chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, which can be a real issue with a subpopulation of people getting treated for cancers. And finally, some of the more recent data shows that both CBD and THC can sensitize the um, cancer cells to first-line agents. So you have a direct activity on inhibiting cancer progression, and you have the ability to sensitize the first-line agents that you're going to get in your cancer therapy. So I like to think of all of that kind of building into a funnel, and in the end, what you get is, of course, we have the improved palliative care that we all know about, but the hope is here that we're going to be able to also inhibit cancer progression and prolong survival. This is a historical slide, and I, I like to kind of, it's, it's fun because it kind of shows the small world of um, cannabinoid science. So the first study that showed anti-tumor activity of cannabinoids, direct anti-tumor activity, was done in 1975 by uh, Dr. Munson. He happened to be my toxicology teacher at school. Um, at that time, I didn't even know he had done this study, but that's how small that world is. I, um, in about 1998, uh, Christina Sanchez, who um, we, we did, she's been talked about a couple of times here, she did one of the first studies. It was a very sort of low, small paper, just looking at the ability of THC to inhibit um, the viability of glioma cells in culture. And I saw that and I thought, wow, that doesn't look like a standard, typical cannabinoid profile. And that's why I got into the field, because of that, that single paper by Christine. Um, and about two years later, uh, Manuel Guzman's group, the group in Spain, actually published this pivotal paper. Uh, it was a nature medicine paper, which really caused the resurgence 
of focusing research on the direct anti-tumor activity of cannabinoids, and that's resulted in over 100 publications now across many different types of cancers. Um, there is this very complex uh, signal transduction pathway. I'm not going to go over all that. I really just want to focus on two things. I just want you to remember autophagy-mediated cell death, because that's going to come up again. And I, that's an important aspect of the ability of, at least with THC and CBD, to kill cancer cells. Another um, portion I want you to focus on is this um, AMP-K. Now, this is an ROS sensor. So when you get reactive oxygen species um, in the body, this is a sensor of reactive oxygen species. And I'm going to uh, talk why I think reactive oxygen species are critical in terms of the anti-tumor properties of THC and CBD. So back to uh, Christina's paper. Soon after that paper, because I'm a pharmacologist, I specialize in cannabinoid compounds, I screened all the compounds that I had available in the lab. And what was most surprising to me is that out of all the compounds I screened, cannabidiol was the most potent. And uh, thanks, Deborah, earlier for talking about micromolar, but this is all expressed in micromolar. Um, that surprised me because a lot of the literature was suggesting this was cannabinoid receptor mediated. Um, but CBD doesn't uh, interact efficiently with those receptors. It certainly doesn't activate them. Another thing, of course, to me was of great interest is, is, as we all know, THC gets you high. CBD does not. Now, why is that important to me as a scientist? Um, it's an easier grant to sell. I know it sounds crazy, but it is a much easier grant to sell. When you go in and say, I'm going to use THC, it's gonna, NIH is going to get nervous. So I knew right away with uh, focusing on CBD that that would actually um, get them more interested and at least get me funding so I could study both the compounds. And so that's the strategy I took, and it, it worked rather well. Uh, <laughs> um, and this is kind of just an overview of the, um, the efficacy data in the vivo model. So what we have here is this is a triple negative breast cancer model in mice. Uh, these are lungs, so the, the tumor actually metastasizes to the lungs. Here's actually, you can see the very prominent tumor formation in the lungs. And here's a mouse treated with CBD. It's very obvious, the efficacy of the compound. We also looked at the same, um, looked at CBD in brain cancer. And here, see the purple portion? This is all tumor throughout the brain. This is a GBM, or a very aggressive form of brain cancer. And here again is, once you treat with CBD, you can really see it's localized to one, one region. So just some of the efficacy data right up front. Uh, okay, so here's my complicated pathway, but really what I want you to get out of this is just to remember some key, key sort of words so that when people ask you about direct anti-tumor agents, uh, cannabis is direct anti-tumor agents, you can say, oh yeah, autophagy, reactive oxygen species, and hopefully ID1, because that's my pet gene. Um, so uh, basically what I'm going to focus first on uh, ROS. So what we found, um, and in this case, this is a triple negative, a human triple negative breast cancer. And what we found is that when um, you increase the concentration of CBD, you produce a fairly profound amount of reactive oxygen species. Now, for all cells, that's bad if you produce too much. Cancer cells actually have mechanisms to deal with ROS because they're more metabolically active than normal cells. So they actually have mechanisms to deal with this. But at a certain point, they can't deal with the ROS overload. So and what's interesting here is this is peroxide. This is our positive control. So you can see in this cancer cell, CBD is highly effective at producing reactive oxygen species. Now, if you then take a normal non-transformed cell and compare it to, this is a, the mouse breast can a triple negative, the human breast cancer, you can see that the um, drug is much more effective at producing reactive oxygen species in, in cancer cells, but not normal cells. And that data has been... Basically, the selectivity between normal cells and cancer cells has been shown by many groups that the, these compounds are selective. OK, so definitely no reason to really focus on all the data here. This is really to make a point. We basically got um, many, actually, primary tumors from brain cancer patients. Um, we treated a variety of these tumors with CBD. And we wanted to get a gene expression profile across many tumors from many different patients to look at some of the key pathways that were either upregulated or downregulated. And what I want you to focus on here again is with CBD, one of the top pathways was autophagy. And again, that circles back to THC, which is also producing autophagy mediated cell death. 
So now we have THC and CBD, quite different, but both impinging upon this autophagy-mediated cell death. We also, um, it doesn't really matter about these names, these represent pathways that absorb ROS. So when you overproduce ROS, these are pathways that basically get upregulated to deal with that insult. So um, that, th this was another top hit in these cells. So really these t cells, when they're treated with uh, cannabidiol, they're dealing with a lot of ROS, and so these pathways are upregulated. And we showed that actually in um, preclinical uh, mouse models of brain cancer. So not only in culture, but also in the preclinical models. So they're dealing with a lot of ROS. And finally, my, one of my favorite genes, um, ID1, was highly downregulated in these tumors, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about ID1 and why it's important. So ID1 is a key gene in the involvement of metastatic progression. So if you're a localized tumor and you need to get out of that space, travel through the bloodstream, get to different organs, ID genes are key genes. You really need these genes. They're actually embryonic genes. They're not in, your, they're not in differentiated adult tissue. They're, they're from the state when you're in embryology. And in that case, you do need the genes because you have to develop your pathways and you, everything has to travel to different sites as you're, as you're building the human body. But in the case of cancer, what it does is it usurps that gene and brings it back in the adult tissues, and then it allows it to travel and go to distant sites. So it's, it's in, a, in a terms of a cancer patient, if you have this gene, it's, 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 it's not good um, prognosis for you. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is that across many different types of cancers, so this is called a Western. Basically, this is the expression of the ID1 protein, okay? When you don't see the black, that means that it's gone. And so we looked across all sorts of um, aggressive cancers that actually express these proteins, and we found across all of these cancers, if you treat them with CBD, you basically are able to turn off this gene. And the way that ID1 works is it's a negative transcriptional regulator. So it actually, when it binds, it turns off transcription. But that's important downstream, and let me explain why. So I like to think of ID1 as sort of a conductor, or a sort of the conductor of many events that happen downstream in the process of metastasis. It's kind of a master regulator. So upstream, when this gets turned on, it causes all these uh, downstream events that then lead to different um, aspects of metastatic progression. So if you can actually cut off the master regulator, you can cut off all these downstream events. And there's been lots of publications by other um, scientists showing, indeed, this is the case. So again, a very important gene in metastatic progression. And this is just many papers just talking about how important ID1 is in um, cancer. So here's some of the original data that we published. Again, back to our Western analysis, here's the ID1 gene. Um, you can see it's expressed here. As you add more drug, it basically disappears. In fact, the first Western we did, we thought we made a mistake, because generally you don't see that. Um, we compared it against other cannabinoid drugs. This is just ID1 expression. You can see it's a effective, again, at down-regulating that expression, but other cannabinoids are less effective. And one measure of studying um, metastasis, at least in culture, is uh, looking at invasion, the ability of these cells to invade through matrix, which is kind of a representation of them invading through tissues. And again, the drug is effective at inhibiting invasion, which makes sense with downregulating this gene. And this is a review of sort of our approach, taking a standard pharmacological approach. So we have CBD. It's an effective inhibitor of ID1. As a pharmacologist, what we do next is we try and create analogs that are even more active than CBD. Um, at targeting ID1. And so I like to call this drug not really a cannabinoid anymore. It's called a, it's actually a resorcinol derivative. Um, I like to term it as an ID1 inhibitor. So if we go down to our Western analysis again, here's CBD, and here is the analog, which is more potent um, at inhibiting ID1. So what does that mean? So in, at least with uh, metastatic breast cancer, when a patient comes in and presents, that's usually later stage, right? A lot of the preclinical models don't actually model later stage. They, mo they model earlier stage. So what we did is because, of course, you're most likely to get the drug at a more advanced stage. We modeled that in, mi in mice, and we had um, two models we used. We had one model, which is a mouse triple negative breast cancer. In this case, they have, the mouse has a functional immune system. Um, and in this case, you have um, 
basically an immune system that's been compromised so that the um, mouse can actually grow a human metastatic um, tumor. So two models, and we compared, um, in the first mouse model, we just compared the activity of CBD and our analog. Let me just kind of orient you to this. 100% means the mouse, all patients or mice are alive, and then as it decreases, this is mice that don't survive. In this model, basically, as soon as they start to show a symptom of tumor burden, they're taken out of the study. Um, and so here's the control group. Here's CBD in terms of survival, and here is the uh, analog we created. So at, at two months, 50% of the mice were still alive, which with this very aggressive model is, is very impressive. Now I should note that with CBD in the earlier stage models, it was effective in earlier stage models, but as we got to the more advanced stage models, it wasn't as effective, hence the thought to create an analog and really focus in on the ID protein um, story because they would already shown using genetic approaches that if you uh, basically decrease the expression of this gene, you could produce substantial inhibition of metastatic progression. So that was the idea there. Um, and again, we use advanced stages here, um, advanced stage model here, and again, this analog uh, was quite effective at increasing survival, at least in this model. Um, so based on the literature with ID proteins, if you downregulate the ID protein, what you do is you will sensitize the cancers, and this is multiple types of cancers to first-line agents, just because of the way the gene works. So of course, the simple experiment would be, well, if CBD can downregulate this gene, it should be able to sensitize the cancers to first-line agents. And this is what we call a combination index plot. You don't really need to understand it. Basically, all you need to know is that anything below one is a synergistic activity. So we combine CBD with um, a standard first-line agent for uh, triple negative breast cancer, paclitaxel. And as you can see in both this, uh, in four T1 cell lines, this is a derivative of that triple negative human breast cancer cell line I showed you. You can see synergistic activity, at, at least in culture. And so that's, I like to transition into this case study based on that data. So since the publication with CBD and ID proteins and just our, our, our group's focus on cancer, I get a lot of case reports sent to me from patients, particularly when it's a good, um, basically when they've seen efficacy. Of course, there's definitely cases where I've seen patients that have been on this that have said that the drug didn't work. But in a cancer setting, that makes complete sense. Not every tumor is going to respond. That's just not possible. But here's a success case. This is a, a patient that actually um, had metastatic breast cancer. They were treated originally, but then it recurred. And you can see it's, it's fairly dramatic. Um, you can see basically tumors all over the body. This patient then uh, went on a cannabis oil. I don't know the makeup of the oil. I didn't get that information. From September 2013 to January 2014, along with the first-line agent. Okay, so they did go back in for another round of first-line agent. And you can see, basically, this is what happened with the patient that came back. It's very dramatic. I mean, this is unusual, to say the least. But it is, you know, it's convincing anecdotal evidence, certainly. And finally, I, this question comes up a lot, and I, you know, I can tell this is great in, in this form because of the talks before me. What's better, um, the drug alone, CBD alone, or CBD combined with THC, and now, of course, THC, CBD, and all these other components that could be in cannabis? That's a question I get a lot. Uh, the answer is, I think it's, you know, it's going to be very specific, not only for the cancer you try and treat, but also the subtypes within a cancer. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of what I call hard evidence to show you the, the complexity of this issue. So here is this model of metastasis. Again, this is 100% metastasis. And as, it, as the number goes down, it means there's less metastasis. So we, this is, at least in this model, this is the most inhibition that THC could produce. And this was the most inhibition that CBD could produce. This is a maximum effective dose. But when you combine them, you actually get greater activity. So I could say in this model, at least in the 4T1 triple negative model, combining THC and CBD is more effective than either of the drugs alone. However, if we then take, uh, this is um, a study we recently did where we compared the ability of CBD versus CBD plus THC, this is a one-to-one -one ratio, um, to basically enhance the activity of TMZ in a, and this is a GBM model, a glioblastoma model, brain cancer. And again, this is a survival curve, but let's focus on here. This is basically CBD plus TMZ and versus CBD 
um, sorry, CBD alone versus CBD plus TMZ. Now, overall, they didn't produce, um, they, they enhanced the activity of CBD, certainly. So that's a, a very positive result. But if you compare the two drugs, there's really no difference between using CBD alone versus the combination. However, in this case, a subset of animals, the tumors did regress completely and didn't return in the CBD group. So, and that has happened before. Um, that also happened in that original Nature paper I showed you as well when they were using THC alone. So, um, again, overall survival, no, but if you, were, if you were this patient, you'd be very happy about getting CBD alone, right? So, I, it, it's, it's a complex problem. We've looked at only a small amount of tumors. Right now, what we're trying to do is look across many different patient types of tumors to get more of a profile, but I think it will be a complicated uh, question. So. Yep, this brings us finally to the um, GBM trial that's actually uh, was done by GW Pharmaceuticals. And I'm gonna quickly just go over this. Uh, basically, they, the patients um, were onboarded with Sativex. Um, I have all the, the dosing information on here. I got this off of, uh, basically this is off the clinical trials. So I, GW hasn't published a detail, so if I'm wrong and GW's here, they can inform us. But uh, basically what they found, it's a pretty impressive enhancement or of survival when they were treated with Sativex. So again, they went from basically, uh, let's see, sorry. <clears throat> basically, they went from 369 in the controls to 550 days with the treatment. So that's, that's actually fairly impressive in GBM. Let's hope that it pans out when they go to a larger clinical trial. And that's just the conclusion. And so I'll say thank you very much for your time.